Okay, thanks for joining me and for this little talk. Um, so we begin. Yes, so th tonight's little talk is about science and religion. We're gonna present this really uh, exciting uh, idea. It's, it's a really exciting development in science. What we're gonna show is that science has basically converged to a point where the, the kind of pieces, the puzzle pieces of science have, have, have developed to a point where you can put those puzzle pieces together to form a picture of the universe and a kind of metaphysical outlook that's identical to the so-called hidden religion or esoteric religion, the perennial wisdom, or the uh, kind of what's, what's called the Prisca Theologia in, during the Renaissance. So that, that's the theme of the talk. And it's uh, really, um, the whole God debate will show in the past 10, 20 years has completely missed the point. You know, this idea that science and religion somehow exist in two separate domains. And we're gonna just show what, what's been happening recently. And it's gonna really, uh, uh, I think, have a big impact on, on things. Okay. Um, so, so what we have to do uh, first is to make clear, okay, so I'm recording, I, I can see myself. Um, we've got to make clear at, at, at the outset that the religion we're talking about is this kind of hidden religion. So it's not the kind of like, you know, the, the kind of religion most people know and hate, the kind of exoteric mysteries of, you know, the church, synagogues, and, uh, you know, the kind of religion we all grew up with, which we kind of mostly abandoned through kind of like a little bit of thought and reason. So I'm just going to share screen, share this little diagram here. Okay, okay, so basically uh, this diagram here, I, I need to make this clear at the outset because um, uh, just to disarm militant atheists who are basically, I give talks and often you see kind of like often young men sat like this with their arms crossed with a kind of really kind of stern, stern expression. We have to really disarm them and also um, sh say at the outset that basically the religion we're talking about is not the outer mysteries, it's not the kind of religion we grew up with, the religion we know and hate. There's kind of inner mysteries of religion. Okay, so the outer mysteries is this outer circle, what we, what we know about religion, you know, what we kind of like, what's more kind of visible, exoteric. Now the esoteric mysteries in Judaism would be Kabbalah, the so-called hidden teachings of Moses, and the uh, in Islam the Batin, the hidden teachings of Muhammad, and uh, in Buddhism the Vajrayana, the hidden teachings of um, Buddha. You see, uh, the, 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 these hidden teachings found in, in all these kind of like mainstream religions, and in Christianity, even in the Bible, it says that Jesus revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven only to the disciples. You see, so this kind of mystery of the kingdom of heaven. What is that? Okay, so. Okay, it's a kind of like a esoteric mysteries. This is where um, kind of religion agrees. Okay, so the exoteric mysteries, that's where the, all the strife is, all the kind of like rules, rituals, regulations, the kind of like uh, fantasies, fairy tales, and fables taken as li literal truth. But in the inner mysteries, we have agreements. Okay, so the Kabbalah, Tantra, the Vajrayana, the kind of Gnostic, Hermetic Christian beliefs, the, the, the kind of Shiite Sufi beliefs, they kind of converge on the same set of beliefs which are the same as the Prisca Theology of the Renaissance and the so-called perennial wisdom. Okay, so that is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Okay, you are screen sharing, so stop share. Okay, don't, don't stop recording, stop share. Okay, so uh, let's make that clear at the outset. Just a quick recap of, of uh, not recap, just to connect this talk, to last week's talk, to those who didn't come and, just, and to those who came uh, last week, just to uh, connect the two talks together, okay? Now, now last week's talk was, Political. So really what we were talking about is just, just uh, we bring back some diagrams from last week. Basically, we uh, explained that behind the Renaissance, there was this kind of hidden Prisca theologia, this kind of like a primal original kind of religion that they were interested in. And that uh, the main books of the Renaissance, they really talk about this inner kind of like, uh, kind of like um, inner mysteries of, uh, of religion. And that these ideas found their way into the oration on the dignity of man. There's a kind of esoteric and apocalyptic undercurrent to the Italian Renaissance. And we explained that these uh, kind of esoteric and apocalyptic ideas found their way into um, the kind of political ideologies, especially revolutionary ideologies, uh, via the Freemasons, the English Civil War, French Revolution, American Revolutions. And even uh, we, we discussed um, in some detail into even an, an adapted form into um, ideologies like Marxism and NSDAP, uh, you know, the Nazi party. So, it's, so somehow these ideas are very uh, potent politically for uh, causing revolutionary change, but also that these ideas were the grounding of uh, kind of principles like human dignity, the, the very idea of progress itself, universalism, equality, liberty, fraternity, meritocracy, human rights, okay, the, the kind of inner box here. 
Now, tonight's talk uh, will show that there's a parallel track uh, to do with this esoteric religion in, in regards to the, uh, the kind of origins of science and technology. Okay, and often the same people and the same organizations are involved. Okay, so, so you've got this kind of political track, which we talked about last week, but you also have this kind of like a kind of like scientific technological track, and that's what we'll be discussing tonight. Okay, so, so here we go. Okay, so um, the Renaissance. Okay, the Renaissance. I mean, uh, without a doubt, the modern world came from the Renaissance. It started from Florence, Italy. Without the Renaissance, the modern world would not exist. Okay, there was a pre-Renaissance uh, that emanated from southern Spain with the conquest of the kind of uh, Muslim cities Toledo and Cordoba. But really, it really got going in Florence. Okay, so, so why? What, what happened? Okay, that, that caused all this kind of political, scientific, technological change. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's go to some key characters now. So share screen again, uh, sharing the screen, the next uh, kind of diagram. Okay. We talked about Marcelo Ficino, who he, in a sense he's the epicenter because he translated all the books. So Renaissance was a rebirth of knowledge. In order to rebirth knowledge, you need to translate the old knowledge into Latin. Okay, so Marcelo Ficino is very like, like the intellectual genius of the Renaissance, one of them, uh, the kind of, uh, kind of literary genius. Okay, now um, our scientific journey begins with Pico della Mirandola, okay, the guy who wrote Oration on the Dignity of Man, which was a very uh, kind of politically significant text, the uh, Manifesto of the Renaissance. Now in it, he says, basically, he writes a lot about magic. Now magic as in Renaissance magus. Now, now I know you gotta suspend your kind of disbelief here, that, but he writes about magic. We're gonna show that there's something deadly serious about the idea of the Renaissance magus and that this Renaissance magus idea was really key to the kind of emergence of the world of uh, science and technology. So, so what is magic? Okay, he goes, he spends paragraph, paragraph describing what it is and what it isn't, uh, what it's not black magic and stuff and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and basically one line he says, he says that magic, white magic or uh, kind of benign magic, when thoroughly investigated, proves to be nothing more than the fullest realization of natural philosophy, unquote, i.e. science. So he's saying that magic is the fullest realization of, of science. Okay. Now, um, Pico di Romandola is a kind of prime example of Renaissance magus who really lived the kind of like, a, the, you know, kind of total power, total knowledge. He really wanted to start this kind of intellectual revolution with a debate that was going to take place in the Vatican, but it was banned. The debate was, it wasn't allowed to take place. Now, the oration on the dignity of man, the manifesto of the Renaissance, is essentially an invitation to debate but it never happened, and eventually he was assassinated in case he was killed. Okay. Now, uh, uh, a generation or so, a couple of generations later, the great Giordano Bruno really took the ideas of Marcelo Ficino and Pico di Romandola and really uh, kind of like, again, kind of lived this idea of Renaissance magus. Now, if you saw the recent uh, remake of the, the, the TV series Cosmos, okay, I, was, I was hugely influenced by Carl Sagan's Cosmos back in the uh, kind of 1980, 81 kind of thing. The remake, the, the first episode of Cosmos, the science show about the about the, the, the sweeping picture of science, the, the first episode devotes 10, 15, 20 minutes to Giordano Bruno. So he's like proto-scientist. So basically, people like the uh, kind of modern thinkers think of him as this kind of proto-scientist. So, so um, he, he came up with ideas like uh, that su the stars in the sky were actually suns and it had planets orbiting them. That's, that's revolutionary, that was heretical. He kind of saw the universe as kind of far, far bigger than what the Vatican or the kind of like uh, scholars at the time thought. So he really was a, on, on the cutting edge. And he was also, he was also killed, <laughs> okay? This is a recurring pattern in our story that these kind of like uh, Renaissance makers get killed. He was burned at the stake, okay, for his, uh, his, uh, his activities. Um, so proto-scientist, uh, Giordano Bruno, okay. And uh, proto-technologist, um, okay, you've all seen this kind of stuff, haven't you? Leonardo da Vinci, absolute genius, apart from all the artwork and stuff. He, he was an inventor. He, he, he kind of, with his kind of visual imagination, he made these contraptions. He actually physically made these kind of like uh, animated robot knights that can actually move the arms and legs. And, and mechanisms actually work. That, you know, modern um, kind of craftsmen have actually made his inventions and, and they, they just, they work, well, sort of work, not, not completely, but you can see he got the gist of the idea in his uh, kind of, in his, uh, in his imagination. So absolute geniuses. So proto-scientists, proto, 
technologist. Okay. Now, now, really, the uh, the whole process of science and technology really gets underway in a kind of in a modern sense with Francis Bacon. Okay, there's, there's no a kind of history of um, science or philosophy of science book worth its salt that does not mention Francis Bacon in the first or second paragraph with big chunks about him because he's the father of modern science. He's the father of the uh, uh, empirical method. So a very important figure. Now, his teacher was John Dee. Okay, he's a very kind of like notorious, a well-known mystic. So he was massively into this kind of Renaissance mega stuff he, he, in his library, which was the biggest library in, in England at the time. He had complete works of Marcelo Ficino and Pico de la Mirandola. So he really kind of lived that Renaissance mega stuff. And he was, himself was a Renaissance man, real, real genius, mathematician, explorer, spy, you name it, he did it. Now, th this uh, ancient woodcutting of John Dee passing the kind of like mystic flame, the knowledge to Francis Bacon, now, Francis Bacon um, basically had to keep his kind of like esoteric beliefs secret because he's in the Queen's court. And these ideas were very heretical. As we saw, uh, people got killed for these ideas. John Dee himself had to escape for his life. His library was ransacked by the mob. And uh, so, so Francis Bacon uh, had to keep it quiet. And, uh, you know, at that time, uh, heresy laws were so strict. If you believed in these books like the Corpus Mescum, you were killed. And we'll show you why. They, they contain some very kind of like, empowering powerful ideas okay we're going to deep dive later on into the corpus medicum so francis bacon uh he you know he wasn't obviously he was an atheist his famous quotation um a little philosophy inclines incline it for the man to atheism depth in philosophy bring it for men around back to religion now he wasn't talking about the church of england or the catholic church he was talking about this hidden religion because he criticized the superstitious religion you see so Francis Bacon, the originator of the scientific method, really, the father of modern science, he also uh, wrote this very influential book called New Atlantis. It's very, very influential. It, it, it's a utopian vision of this, this island, the fictitious island. And uh, basically, it's like a technological scientific utopia. And in the New Atlantis, he describes an institute called the House of Salomon. Okay, the, the key passage in New Atlantis, okay, is, is the, the passage which goes... Um, the end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and the secret motions of things, and the enlarging the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. My God, affecting all things possible. That, that kind of means like total power, doesn't it? If, to be able to affect all things possible, which uh, takes us to this kind of like idea of the Renaissance magus, what the Renaissance magus was about, and it derives from the Corpus Medicum, was this idea of total knowledge and total power. So the famous John Dee quotation, knowledge is power, has a far deeper meaning to it than most people would, would normally think. Okay, so uh, this uh, House of Salomon, okay, it's a very influential book. The, uh, the um, what's called the Royal Society here in London, okay, the, the so-called midwife of modern science was modeled on the House of Salomon and the patron saint of the Royal Society is Francis Bacon. Okay, that's really, really appropriate, isn't it? Now the, uh, the founder, of the, uh, the Royal Society was basically a guy who was the leader of this thing called the Invisible College. Now, Christopher Wren, another Renaissance genius, uh, English Renaissance, um, basically he, uh, he the, the Invisible College, okay, what it was, it was essentially a Freemason meeting group. It was a speculative Freemason meeting group. They met to discuss the nature of God and discuss science, but they saw science as investigating the nature of God, trying to understand God, okay. So essentially, the midwife of modern science, the Royal Society, was essentially derived from a mystical meeting group of mystically inclined Corpus Medicum reading Freemasons, okay, essentially. And then later on, um, we have the figure of uh, the last Magus, okay, he's been called the last Magus and the first scientist, Isaac Newton, and many people think of him as the greatest scientist of all time, even greater than Einstein. Now, Isaac Newton was a contemporary of, uh, of Christopher Wren, slightly, slightly younger, but it was that, that kind of same period, really, that of, of, of the emergence of science. So you see, uh, th these are kind of like, these are really like historical facts. There's nothing controversial about what I said. There's volumes written about what I said. So basically, without a doubt, uh, the origins of science is associated with this kind of hidden religion, this kind of corpus medicum, Freemason, kind of like Prisca Theologia religion that emerged during the Renaissance. Now, um, an atheist or militant atheist or Marxist scholar would say, but so what way? You know, so what? 
it's incidental. I mean, they did their science, they did their science and technology despite their wacky, kooky beliefs. Well, that absolutely is not the case. That is not that is not the case, and we'll tell you why well, that's not the case. That absolutely, the ideas from the Corpus Medicum were was instrumental to the advent of modern science and technology. Okay, so just stop the share so I can see myself. And I can see loads of people. Great, no, great, that's, that's, that's great. Okay, so, okay, look, the, the reason why uh, these ideas really gave rise to science, okay, can completely be found in the Corpus Medicum. Now, like I said last week, you can, <clears throat> you can download the Corpus Medicum for free, just type Corpus Medicum PDF and you get it for free. It's out of copyright. So it's kind of secret, secret knowledge that the, the Medici was so wanting to get that really gave rise, I believe, to the modern world, and I'll show you why, is it, you can get it for free off the internet. Okay, now, okay, we're gonna explore this uh, idea called the Francis Yates hypothesis. Now, Francis Yates was a Warburg, Warburg scholar, Warburg, Warburg Institute, part of the London University, very respected scholar, worked in the kind of, was very productive during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, she died in 1981. Now, again, type any of her books out of copyright, PDF, you get all her books, amazing. Uh, one of the best scholars of the Renaissance there is, basically. Now, her, her, her hypothesis is, uh, the, the Yates hypothesis, is that basically the Corpus Semesticum provided a shift in mindset that enabled the Renaissance men to think in a different way, which really propelled the enterprise of science. And it derived from a new understanding of the fall. So there's a definition of Adam, which is very different from Genesis, and it's absolutely heretical, and it's absolutely dangerously empowering. Okay, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's really dangerous information, and uh, this is why all these heretics were killed. And I'll tell you what, what the information is. Okay, the eighth hypothesis says what it is, and I'll go through the, the, the specific passages later on. Uh, basically, that the fallen Adam in the Pymanda, the second book of the Corpus Mesicum, basically, um, yes, falls but can gain redemption, go back to the state before the fall through his efforts, through attaining knowledge and power. Okay, very different from, uh, you know, the Adam of the, the Catholic Church or Church of England might kind of want to, pr want to promote. So it, it's saying that basically uh, the fallen Adam for his own religion can actually attain back to the Garden of Eden or the state before the fall. That's, that's really dangerous, isn't it? <clears throat> and and uh, okay, so so uh, there's there's a kind of shift in mindset that these suddenly these, these uh, Renaissance men believe that their science and their technology was basically a path to something much higher than just gaining power and money and wealth and status. It was a religious mission. Okay, now uh, you know Marxist scholars and atheist scholars will say, you know, there's no this uh, Francis Yates hypothesis. Is it plausible? I mean, there's no written evidence. There's no kind of like physical evidence for it. And that's one of the main complaints. Well, there wouldn't be written evidence because you left this kind of evidence at that time, you would, would have been killed. Okay, so that explains why there's no kind of written evidence. Francis Bacon, Bacon or John Dee saying, I'm heavily into the Corpus Medicum and, you know, or even uh, Giordano uh, Bruno and uh, Pico de Mirandola had to be quite bleak about their beliefs because if you announced it, you would have been executed, burned at the stake. So that's the reason why there's no written evidence, okay. But if we examine the actual passages of the Corpus Medicum, the, the question is not, is her hypothesis plausible? Is it, it becomes how can it not be the case? Okay, apart from believing that uh, redemption and uh, kind of like attaining this kind of like ultimate state comes from your own efforts and through technology and science and understanding, the, the, I mean the key passages really is in in really in the uh, in the the uh, book two, the Pymanda, really is it, des it describes the fall. It describes God making creation, looking upon his creation and then getting to work in the creation. And through that, he is separated from the father. So it's not Adam and God, basically, because it makes clear in the Corpus Medicum, there's only one soul. Quote, there's only one soul, there's only one life, there's only one matter. Who is that? Who else can it be but the one God? So again and again, it repeated throughout. The maker and the maid are one and inseparable. The worker, the workman, the workmanships are one and the same. So it's very clear that this kind of descent, the fall, separation from the father is essentially a state of God forgetting who he is and entering into the, the, what is called the, the realm of generation and creation. And basically, um, in, in line 47, it is asked rhetorically, uh, Holmes Tristan just asked, 
but how does he who knows who he is, why and how does he go back to the father? Okay, and it, uh, lots of flowery kind of language and then it's right there. In order to return to the father, okay, they themselves, they themselves give themselves over to the powers, become the powers and they are in God. That's really heretical, isn't it? And then, uh, and then to them that know, this is the good, to them that know to be, to be deified. That is mad, isn't it? It's saying basically they know to be deified, to become God. And the way to do this is to gain power in this body, in this world. And that is how you basically elevate yourself to the condition before the fall. Uh, some mystics here will say, well, that's like Tantra, isn't it? And that's like Kabbalah. And that's like, uh, well, well, yeah, exactly. That's like the path of the mythic quest era. Totally, yes, com completely. But it was a revelation to uh, Renaissance Europe, okay? We examine some other passages in, in chapter book, book or chapter 13 um, of the Corpus Mescum. Uh, describes the absolute, uh, you know, in, almost in tedious repetition, the, the inseparability of sensing and understanding. You can't sense and you can't, without understanding, you can't understand without sensing. That the sensing and understanding of this world are one. And then it says, it's the organ and instrument of the will of God. And we see in chapter 13, absolutely Bacon's empiricism is right there. Okay, it's right, it's basically if Bacon read this kind of stuff, and we know he, we, we don't, written proof he did, but he would have done. All the Renaissance men were into Corpus Medicum. Basically, uh, it would, uh, you know, basically how can someone like, uh, if you read about this uh, sensing and understanding being the will of God, how can you not emphasize, you know, empiricism? So it's almost like Bacon's, uh, kind of empirical method straight from the pages of the Corpus, Corpus Mexican book, book 13. And in the Renaissance men, <clears throat> when uh, in chapter 10, book, book 10, it tells you, my God, it tells you, it, te it tells you to believe in thyself that nothing is impossible. It's telling you that you can understand all things, every art and every science and the manner and custom of every living thing. Then you understand why the Renaissance men were Renaissance men. They took uh, you know, like, like, you know, Bacon, I take all knowledge be my province. They were theoreticians, they were translators, they were artists, they were, they did everything, they were thinkers, they were Renaissance men. Did you get it? It's straight from the pages of the Corpus Medicum. And uh, when you couple these ideas with um, this idea that it's telling you you can understand all, you can gain this kind of power to change all, you can basically, it's telling you uh, another passage which this would have got yourself, this would get yourself killed even today in some countries. There's a passage which is telling you in chapter 10 to equal thyself to God, if you want to understand God, because only the like can understand the like. Okay, it's all there. When you take it together, when you take it, this uh, kind of empiricism, you take this kind of like exhortation to, quote, increase yourself to an immeasurable greatness, to, to uh, you know, to, to exhorting yourself to understand all things that you can, every art, every science, Coupled with this idea that the Renaissance men believed that what they were doing through doing this was really to attain the state before the fall, to become unified with God. When you take all these things together, if people believe in these kind of things, okay, then you can see how the Renaissance men fought the way they did, did the things that they did, okay. So the Francis Yates hypothesis is not uh, plausible. It is, it is absolutely completely sensible. And to argue against the Francis Yates hypothesis to say that somehow these kind of hermetic ideas didn't influence the Renaissance men is to say that somehow there's a compartment in these men's minds of all these ideas, which would have made them do, which would have made them do exactly what they did, but somehow they did what they did separate from this side of their brain because it's a complete compartment. That's complete nonsense, isn't it? Okay, so, so basically that is, in an essence, the, the secret of the Renaissance men, and it's right in the Corpus Medicum. Okay, read it, read it, I mean, really go through it and, but with detail. Then you, you, you see exactly why these people did what they did. Okay, so, so um, the next section is gonna basically bring these ideas right up to date for the 21st century. Now, this is quite a history lesson, isn't it? That's quite like a, you know, quite a kind of retrospective. And, uh, and these ideas sound completely mad, but if we can return these ideas, justify the, these ideas with the, the most cutting edge science, we can make these ideas come to life for the 21st century, we believe. 
So we'll do, we'll, do that, we'll do that in the next section, but are there any questions at this point? <clears throat> are there any questions? If not, then I'll just roll along and I'll just go to the next stage. Okay, okay, great. I mean, I mean, I'm not great. I mean, questions are great, but you know, if, if there's no questions, that's great as well. Um, okay, so so we're gonna just trundle along now. Okay, so so that's the history lesson. Okay, that's the history lesson behind the Renaissance. Now we're gonna go to the present. Okay, basically, we we believe that uh, the the process of science and technologies began in the Renaissance and it basically created the modern world and it created this process of science which has investigated the universe and uh, basically uh, kind of really listed the universe, investigated the earth and, and bodies and stuff. And along the way, the kind of like the religion was lost. So basically people forgot the origins of science and they lost kind of lost their souls. I mean, literally they lost the idea of a soul and even the idea of a God. Okay, okay, Darwin had a lot to do with that. But no, Darwin grappled with God in his life. But I mean, the fear of evolution really did uh, kind of like really did uh, was a major factor. We have, we have a state today where basically people say there's a complete separation. There can be no kind of like uh, reconciling science and religion. That's completely mistaken. And I'll show you exactly why. Okay. We think that through the progression of history, that basically, yes, God has been eliminated, eliminated but it's the, the God of exoteric religion, it's the God of myths, fantasies, fables, and uh, or myths in the kind of sense of taken as literal, and these kind of rules, rituals, regulations. But we're going to show that basically the progression of science is going to completely return the, the Prisca theologia or hidden religion. Okay, so um, just gonna bring up this uh, next diagram. Okay, so we're gonna explain now, okay, how modern science is gonna basically completely return us to the Prisca Theologia. Uh, okay, so um, in, in this diagram, am I, am I sharing a diagram? Am I sharing a diagram? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I've got the, uh, is that being shared? I'm getting confused there. So that's, that's a Zoom and uh, is that, Oh, 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 I haven't shared diagram, so I need to share a diagram. You can all see a diagram, can't you? Okay, you can see a diagram. Okay, so, so look, we have, we, okay, first off, okay, first off, uh, these five points, we just go through them in sequence. The idea of a, a illusory universe, okay, has always been there for, for many decades, and uh, it's, it's mainly through uh, the kind of investigations of quantum mechanics. So, for example, uh, the great John Wheeler, who worked with Albert Einstein, he said, according to quantum mechanics, there's no out there, out there. Quote, there's no out there out there. And, and uh, Einstein's biographer, Abraham Pais, okay, uh, the famous uh, kind of quote where Einstein asks Abraham Pais, so, so Abraham Pais was an accomplished quantum physicist himself, okay, so he asked Abraham Pais, so, so Abraham, if, if I don't look at the moon, then it's not there, he's saying. And, and yeah, because Abraham Pais did uh, subscribe to Copenhagen interpretation, he said, yeah, it's, it's not there. Now, this, uh, this baffling side of quantum mechanics really converges with a, a, side, a kind of like an idea in philosophy called uh, ontological idealism, which says that existence is essentially um, consciousness. Consciousness is first. And this uh, follows from reasoning from uh, lines of reasoning from Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant, uh, two of the giants of uh, Western philosophy. I mean, Rene Descartes is called the father of Western philosophy, so intellectual giants. They kind of reason their way to the idea that basically the physical world, the, the so what can't call the noumenal world, you can never know it directly in itself as it is. It's always mediated through your consciousness. And René Descartes tortuously, tediously reasoned basically in his famous uh, kind of meditations, uh, that basically I can never know the physical world. And the only thing I can know is, is that the famous cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. What he's talking about is about, about his first person subject to reality. So this idea of uh, there's no out there out there really converges with this kind of philosophical uh, undercurrent, which is more kind of prevalent on the continent, mainly because of Rene Descartes and, and Emmanuel Kant were more influential. Uh, so ontological idealism, uh, kind of what's called uh, phenomenology, kind of studying the contents of uh, consciousness and also existentialism is really big on the continent and less so in the uh, kind of Anglo-Saxon world we find. And then this is the reason why. But also this idea of an illusory universe from uh, quantum mechanics, it also converges with this idea called sanyata in Buddhism of a kind of illusory nature of reality and also maya, of course, in Hinduism, that some of reality is illusory. These ideas cause uh, some of the, the biggest names, the founders of quantum mechanics, most of whom were German speaking, and that the kind of German philosophic intellectual tradition is more sympathetic to idealism, uh, mainly because of Immanuel Kant and, and a philosopher called uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Okay. 
so um, many of the founders of quantum mechanics really uh, just saw what they saw and, and they gravitated towards Eastern mysticism. The, the, the Erwin Schrodinger wrote a book called uh, What is Life? Again, type What is Life PDF yet copy. In, in the epilogue, he kind of writes down his thoughts basically in the epilogue and, and he, he's this is, is wild stuff. I mean, the book is very influential. Uh, James Watson and uh, Francis Crick, who developed, uh, you know, kind of discovered uh, DNA, they Crick wrote to Erwin Schrodinger after they won the uh, Nobel Prize for DNA discovery. And he said, yeah, James and I were very influenced by your little book. You know, the little book and the epilogue, he, Erwin Schrodinger writes what he thinks. He, he, he you know, writes the kind of Bhagavad Gita, Atman equals Brahman kind of like uh, formulation, soul of a person and God are one and the same. But also writes, he writes, uh, he writes, Deus factus sum, I have become God. And he, then he says, you know, this is the wisdom of the ancients. He's basically saying, this is what I believe, okay. So I, I can go on, you know, you know like uh, Heisenberg, got to Zen Buddhism, uh, Niels Bohr had a yin and yang, his coat of arms. Uh, Pauli worked with Carl Gustav Jung in this kind of synchronous uh, non-causal physics. So basically these uh, kind of like uh, founders of quantum mechanics really found themselves gravitating towards a kind of Eastern mysticism essentially and kind of more of a kind of mystical idealist view of the universe. Okay, to be fair, there's other views in science. There's, there is, you know, physicalism still supported by this thing called parallel, um, you know, kind of like many worlds hypothesis uh, of, uh, of quantum mechanics. So, so there are competing uh, views, but for our purposes, it's enough to say that there is this kind of very valid interpretation of what is, you know, what a scientific interpretation of reality, which is actually, you know, was subscribed to by the, the people who founded quantum mechanics in the first place. Okay, now, now we go to point two. Okay, it's already well saying reality is illusory. There's no out there out there, but of course there's something out there, isn't there? There's some like, you know, a set of invite to this talk and you all, you know, saw the same invite. There's some kind of objective reality that we all share. Or we wouldn't be in this Zoom meeting, would we? So we've got to explain what's out there. And that's been the main Achilles heel of our idealism. You've got to explain the out there out there in a kind of satisfactory way. And the explanation uh, is a very old one and it's returned, it's come back in, well not in fashion, but it's come back into the realm of a kind of scientific discourse through a, a, a kind of like a, a, a physicist, an MIT physicist called, called Max Tegmark, okay, because he's basically written a book called Our Mathematical Universe, he wrote papers about it before. He's basically resurrected a very ancient idea. It's not, not a new idea, it's, it's a very ancient one. He's actually quotes, in, in, not in this book, in, in one of his earlier papers, he actually quotes Pythagoras, the universe is a number. In his book, he mentions Pythagoreans because Pythagoras has been expunged. It's like he doesn't want to, <laughs> almost doesn't want to say, he's just taking the ideas of this, this guy, this kind of mystic cult leader from like 3,000 years ago. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> anyway, so he quotes Pythagoras and uh, many uh, famous uh, scientists like Galileo, um, who wrote that uh, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Isaac Newton saying that God is a mathematician. And a famous quote from Eugene Wigner, the uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist, who said that he talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in describing the physical world. And what it means is that basically there's this really deep relationship between science, physics, and the real world. And, 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 and the real world and mathematics. So it's something about mathematics that somehow has this really deep relationship with, with the universe. Kind of mathematical ideas kind of like pursued for their own intrinsic beauty, then suddenly found, find that we, we find that they are perfectly suited to describing the physical universe. So Einstein's relativity derived from this thing called non-Euclidean geometry is all worked out by mathematicians beforehand for its own intrinsic beauty. And it, then if it hand, hand in glove, to describe the universe. Okay, so <clears throat> the idea of mathematical universe has come back in vogue. Well, not, I mean, it's come back in a kind of public discourse and in the realm of scientific discourse because Max Tegmark has brought it back. And you get people like big names like uh, like Ed Witten and uh, Brian Greene, these kind of established physicists, a huge names review his book. They can't say, they can't dismiss it as woo or kind of like nonsense, or they basically, Look at his idea. Did not necessarily agree with it, but it's a for them. It's a valid hypothesis now. Okay. And I want to make sure that we get everything we are paying for out there with my good friends, uh, Sir Max. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. What was that? Okay, okay. Mathematical universe. Okay. So basically, we got this kind of idea that's come back in, in into kind of public discourse. But but what does it mean? Okay. What does it mean? Uh, I mean, how is the universe mathematical? Okay. We, we need to explain basically. Uh, 
um, that, okay, first, that this idea is very old. Now we talked about uh, Pythagoras and we talked about, um, we talked about um, how he, the universe's number and basically the idea is his. Now there's a lineage of ideas from Pythagoras. Okay, Pythagoras, hugely influential uh, thinker, brought the Egyptian mysteries to Greece. The Greek mysteries derived from Pythagoras, according to Aristotle and Plato. Okay, now, okay, Plato, the huge, hugely influential Plato, yes, Mr. Alfred North Whitehead, intellectual giant of the 20th century, the famous quote, all Western philosophy is footnotes to Plato, and there's some truth in what he's saying, okay. The, the, the hugely influential giant of philosophy, Plato, himself was a Pythagorean. Okay, so you've got to understand there's a lineage of ideas when Plato's forms, you know, that somehow these forms transcend physical reality. They're really of the same lineage as the ideas of Pythagoras, because he's a Pythagorean. And then the, the idea of the logos, this kind of like cosmic principle, is understood by different ancient Greek philosophers in different ways. But of course, Plato's this huge philosopher. It was his interpretation which was really uh, dominant. Now, now, Philo was a Hellenized Jew working in Alexandria, and he uh, uh, kind of incorporated this idea of Logos, Greek idea of Logos, into Judaism. And this idea of Logos found its way into the St. John Gospel, uh, translated as the Word. Okay, the famous St. John Gospel, which we mentioned last talk, is the, apparently the favorite gospel of the, uh, of the Freemasons. And uh, we also mentioned that uh, Marcelo Ficino and Martin Luther both, both thought that the St. John Gospel and the Corpus Mescum were written by the same person. Now, this idea of the word, okay, St. John Gospel, uh, okay, uh, the, the famous quote, the very first lines of the St. John Gospel, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word is God. The word was with God in the beginning. With the word, everything was made. Without the word, Logos, nothing was made that has been made. So you think about that. This is a kind of like idea deriving from Pythagoras. So somehow the entire universe creation is contained in this logos. Okay, now what's the nature of this logos? There's a, a recent discovery in mathematics called the Mandelbrot set in fractal mathematics that helps us to understand the nature of this logos and the nature of mathematical, mathematical existence in relation to the universe. Okay, sure, so Plato had dodecahedrons and stuff, and uh, Pythagoras had, had dodecahedrons, but that's very far removed from the messiness and the complexity of the physical universe. But this Mandelbrot set really does allow us to really understand, uh, as a kind of metaphor, the nature of the universe as a mathematical object. Now, uh, the Mandelbrot set has been called the fingerprint of God, okay? Now, it's, it's astounding, it's like magic, it really is like magic. Okay, that's the Mandelbrot set formula. Okay, it's, it's astounding. It's, it's a recursive formula, so it goes, it goes round and round. You kind of keep feeding the back upon itself, feeding the result back on itself recursively, thousands of times to generate uh, images. So th this is these are complex numbers. Okay, so, but that's, it's pretty simple stuff. So it's a pretty simple equation. Okay, so it's a very simple equation, and this an equation it contains an object that has infinite detail. Now that's the, the entire Mandelbrot set. Okay. It's a physical shape, it's, sorry, it's a mathematical shape that can be depicted on my physical computer screen. And you see this kind of Mandelbrot set, okay. Now this Mandelbrot set is, has infinite detail and that infinite detail is contained in that equation. There's absolutely nothing random going on. Now you see this Mandelbrot set uh, uh, it kind of on, on the side, it's like a snowman, isn't it? That's its kind of body, that's its head, that's kind of like its anus. <laughs> that's just kind of like, like a little hat on the, and it's like his little arms and little legs, okay. So basically the man's brought set, if you kind of zoom in that little box, okay, I zoom in that box and basically I get this box, okay. Now I zoom into that little box and I get this box, okay, this, this, this great box, and I zoom into there and look, there's another, there's another snowman, isn't there? There's another snowman shape. Well, it's been proven that there's actually an infinite number of those snowmen contained in the Mandelbrot set. So it's an infinite object. You keep zooming into the, inf the Mandelbrot set and it contains an infinity of beauty and shape, never repeating, never kind of, uh, kind of, kind of it's basically an infinity of variety. It contains a universe within an equation. So that's the final, you can, keep, you can keep zooming forever. It never ends, it's, it's infinite. It goes in for infinite detail. Now, to, just to, to really appreciate the Mandelbrot set, I want to play a little animation a friend made. Okay, so basically that's the entire Mandelbrot, you're zooming into it, you're zooming in, you're just, you're just flying into it and then you're basically seeing the, the, the splendor, the infinite complexity and beauty of the Mandelbrot set. It's astounding that that equation contains all this detail, isn't it? Now the question is, did Mandelbrot, did he, discover the Mandelbrot set? Did it discover all this beauty or path and pattern or did he make it? 
obviously he didn't create it, did he? He, didn't, he hasn't made all this uh, beauty and pattern, so he must have discovered it, okay. Now, if Mandelbrot discovered the Mandelbrot set, the, the question is, where did the Mandelbrot set exist before it was discovered? And the answer is, it, it exists platonically, it exists transcendently. So if the universe was to end, completely explode, and life had to re-evolve, and uh, the new universe rediscovered the Mandelbrot set, it would be exactly the same. So it transcends all physical reality. Okay, so that's the nature of the Mandelbrot set. So the simple idea is basically the universe exists in the same way that the Mandelbrot set exists. And the Mandelbrot set now provides us with a way of understanding how the Logos, the single cosmic principle, can contain the entire universe as a single mathematical object. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea, uh, and uh, which leads to the next idea. If the, if the universe is like the Mandelbrot set, which describes this kind of fractal object containing an infinite number of snowmen, okay, like fractal object, it's self-similar, it contains copies of itself. So the, the entire big snowman contains an infinite um, number of, of little snowmen. If the universe is like the Mandelbrot set, then surely, then surely it must be the case that the universe is fractal. Okay, so this is the next idea that the universe, yes, is indeed fractal. So it's been known for a long time that the distribution of matter in the universe is fractal. Okay, it's statistical studies. But kind of more recent research shows us basically that it goes far, far deeper. It goes far deeper than that. So um, back to my diagrams. Okay, so Mandelbrot set. Okay, that's just another fractal. It's a natural kind of broccoli uh, uh, kind of, so it's got a Romanesque broccoli, sorry, that's some Romanesque broccoli, that's a kind of like a, a fractal uh, dodecahedron, so it doesn't have a fractal shape. Then the most common fractal of all, okay, that we see every day is basically a tree. So it's a fractal, it's like a little bonsai, it's like a great big tree, like the, the, the even the uh, veins in the leaf is like a, like a tree structure, it's kind of branching, okay, a branch is like a little branch, it's like the entire tree itself. So the most common fractal and most uh, important fractal, I think, is the tree. Now, this idea of a tree kind of converges to ancient ideas of the universe as a tree. So if you have this kind of like a, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the Asvatha tree of the entire universe, this is this tantric diagram of the, the chakras and the, the, the radiations of the nadi. This is the tree of Sephiroth, that some of the universe is a tree, this is an inverted tree of Sufism. This idea of recurring Yggdrasil, uh, kind of like the motif of the universe as a tree. What my, modern science has been uh, discovering is that indeed uh, you get these kind of like tree-like, neuron-like neuron almost structures, okay. This is from a computer simulation of the kind of grand cosmic structure of the universe. So basically what it, what it says is that matter and energy coalesce into these kind of, into these kind of like cosmic structure, filamental, and actually a paper just uh, in a few weeks ago kind of, kind of uh, added more uh, kind of empirical observational uh, kind of confirmation of this of this simulation and and just kind of like a it's, it's sort of like a neuron isn't it it's sort of like a mouse neuron you know it's kind of like a it's, a, it's like a weak parallel but and it, it sort of looks like one now if we go to the simulation then we can see the, the kind of like dynamic simulation of this uh or, or, you know basically so this is like a fly through of this computer simulation it just means that these kind of like tendril tree-like neuronal structures are found at all scales it's fractal so you take the, the, the structure of the entire universe, you get the kind of neuron-like structures, you keep zooming in, and you, you keep getting these kind of the same structures at, at whatever scale, basically. So, so it's just the fractal distribution of matter, which we've known for a long time, kind of coalesces itself into these kind of like fractal filaments. Okay, so it's just like a, the, the, the computer simulation of this kind of like tree-like structure that kind of spans the entire universe. Now, this is called Laniakea. Now, this is not a computer simulation. This is actually uh, observational data from the Hubble Space Telescope. So, this is the, the largest structure known to man, and this is about 600 million light years. That's huge, isn't it? 600 million light years. Now, okay, these, these points are not stars. Each of these points is a galaxy. And this structure here is not made up of stars, it's actually made up of galaxies. And our entire galaxy is this little speck here. Well, I mean, it's, not, it's, not, it's smaller than that spec. That's quite a big blue dot, isn't it? But it's actually just a tiny little uh, sub-pixel. So our galaxy of uh, uh, you know, 100 billion stars is one speck of this 600 million light year structure containing 100,000 galaxies. And uh, so that's a pretty big structure. And you have this kind of, again, it's kind of tree-like structure and a kind of branching 
palm tree like and and the the group that made this uh kind of uh, kind of like observation this kind of like discovery believes that this kind of tree like structure is part of a is a branch of a bigger tree okay so this is a really like a uh, you know really quite interesting isn't it so basically the, these tree like structures fractally span the entire universe that, that's the idea so so basically the universe is indeed fractal now um Okay, so so universe as fractal, and uh, so this is a, a very ancient idea. So the the, the Upanishads, um, one of my favorite verses of the Upanishads, uh, as is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, so is the cosmic mind. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm, and as is the atom, so is the universe. And indeed, this is what is being found. I mean, interestingly, back to quantum mechanics, there's, there's a kind of wheel at the wit equation, which basically, I mean, that passage, as is the atom, so is the universe, it basically extrapolates Schrodinger's wave equations to the entire universe. So, so literally, a very influential equation, literally, is, is saying that as is a subatom, so is the universe. Okay, so fractals in the universe is, is become very fashionable these days. Now, for our next exhibit, for our next uh, kind of uh, the next point on this diagram, okay, fractal universe, okay, purposeful universe, okay, how is the universe purposeful? Okay, we, we kind of touched on, on this in, in the last talk in the questions and answers, it kind of came out. Okay, so this is a diagram from, uh, actually, I stole this from a Paul Davis talk. It's actually like you see, you see, time flows, and as time flows, then basically you get this kind of like, uh, you know, this kind of pattern forms as time flows. Now, what it is, is basically science in, in recent years, literally in the past few decades, has basically resurrected the idea of a purposeful universe. Okay, um, there is a very, okay, I'll go back to, um, I'll go back to the, okay, so, so I'll go back to the camera now. What it is, okay, basically the idea of a purposeful, meaning, meaningful universe has returned okay through three major ideas in, in uh, cutting edge uh, physics basically and I'll, I'll tell you what they are okay the, the first one is from a, a, a physicist called Zakir Aharonov okay he is very he, he, he's, he's a very kind of like a, he won the kind of like a, the the 2010 uh, uh, science medal, the American Presidential Science Medal, very prestigious. He was nominated for the 29 uh, Nobel Prize for Physics. Apparently, he was a very high contender, according to Reuters. He didn't get it, but he, he, you can see he's a, he's a mainstream, uh, kind of fairly prominent physicist. Now, he had he has the idea of this thing called uh, time symmetric quantum mechanics. Okay. And what he is saying is basically, uh, and there has, has been some, well, some kind of uh, empirical, empirical corroboration of his idea. What he's saying is that basically uh, he's, he's inverted quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics normally flows forwards in time, okay, kind of emanating all these parallel universes. Now, what he's saying is basically there's a time inverted quantum mechanics that flows from the future. And he says, basically, there's a destiny wave function. Not my words, his words. He says there's a destiny wave function that emanates from the future backwards in time. And that destiny wave function pulls the fate of the universe to a set conclusion. So that's mad, isn't it? That's, that's wild. So this is a very kind of like a prominent physicist arguing the case for a kind of teleological universe. Okay, it's actually very elegant. If, you know, if time flows, if quantum, quantum mechanics flows forwards, you're just saying, why don't we suppose it flows backwards? If there's no privileged arrow of time, which we'll explain in a minute that there is not, then it makes sense to have this time symmetric quantum mechanics, which very kind of like elegantly kind of argues for the idea of a purposeful, meaningful universe that this uh, you know, kind of like set destiny, everything has meaning in relation to that set destiny. Okay, that's, that's one uh, modern kind of thread in modern physics that supports the idea of teleology or a purposeful universe. Now, now the, the other two ideas which really uh, sort of support the, the same thing, it comes from two of the main contenders for grand unified theory of everything. That, that, that means to unify uh, a kind of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, The two main contenders for grand unified theory in the world today is something called string theory and the other one's called loop quantum gravity. Now, the interesting thing is both theories derive a result, okay, that says that there is a pre-Big Bang epoch. 
So the Big Bang is not, not the beginning. So if this is the Big Bang, it kind of goes bang and it kind of goes wherever it goes. There's actually a pre-Big Bang epoch before it. Now, the interesting thing is both these theories, both these grand unifying theories are both saying that there is a pre-Big Bang epoch. And they're saying the pre-Big Bang epoch is the mirror image of this epoch. Okay. Now, there is this idea called CPT symmetry, okay, established idea in physics, okay, Nobel prizes duly handed out in the 60s and 50s, a very, very kind of established idea. And what it says basically, if you, like a mirror image, basically, it, CPT means charge, polarity, and time. If you invert any of those, you have to invert the other two. So polarity means if you have a mirror image, you've inverted the polarity. It is saying that basically, if you invert the polarity, then you invert time. Okay, invert charge means matter becomes matter, antimatter, sorry, antimatter becomes matter, and matter becomes antimatter. Okay, so this pre -bang, Big Bang epoch, basically at the Big Bang, it flips the mirror image. So basically time inverts. And what it means is basically, we think we are going forwards in time, but no, it means that we are bouncing back because at the point of the Big Bang, time inverts. Therefore, we think we're flowing forwards, but we're actually, time has flipped. We're actually bouncing back to the origin. Do you get it? So basically, as we, we're going forwards in time, there's a pre-Big Bang epoch that essentially, because it's a mirror image, it contains all the information in the future because it's already happened. It, it's like a photographic negative. You know, you know matter is antimatter, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, antimatter is matter. It's like a photographic negative. It contains all the information for this universe, for the future. So what it's essentially saying the same thing, we're bouncing back to a set conclusion. So the, basically the future has already happened. That's quite a religious idea, like in the Bible, in the Quran, that everything is written, Book of Romans, everything is written as in a book, the future is written as in a book. And Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is told to you know, go into battle, he's, he's ha having angst because he has to kill his relatives and stuff. He just says, no, go there, it, it's all happened already. Th those who are slain are slain already. Those who are, who are gonna live, that the, the, has already been determined. Just go in peace and do it, okay. It, it means basically uh, these free currents, okay, this, they're all supporting the idea of teleology, quantum mechanics, loop quantum gravity, super string theory. It suggests that there is a unification of these three ideas into a single unified theory that supports the idea of teleology. So when people tell you that science implies that the universe is purposeless and meaningless, what well, might have done twenty years ago, here. but not anymore. Okay. So now we mm. now we ask. Okay, if if basically the universe is second. Mm, ich komme jetzt mal, aber ich komme, mach heute nicht lang. Okay. What what is that? How can we know what that conclusion is? Okay, is known to God. Is you know, the transcendent equation of the universe. How can we know what that set conclusion is? We can, if the universe is fractal, if it's self-similar, if there's a self-symmetry, a symmetry behind the universe, we can extrapolate to what we know on this level, on this time scale into the universe. So what do we know? Okay, so let's uh, return to our diagrams. Okay, we can, we can work out what the end is through simple extrapolation. Okay, um, but back to my diagrams. Okay, we know there's this kind of process whereby you know, a single cell emanates from a point becomes a human body. This process of the universe where kind of like, you know, you know kind of this, this, this mass of energy becomes kind of particles becomes uh, kind of like uh, atoms becomes complex molecules, becomes DNA, complex macromolecules, becomes single cell animals, becomes life, becomes animals, herds of animals, becomes human beings, tribes of human beings. And it's becoming this one world order. It's kind of like, the, it's kind of coming together in this process. If we simply extrapolate that process to the universe, it just means that basically the universe becomes as one. It becomes like this cosmic Christ, this celestial Buddha, this kind of universal Vishnu, which is what the kind of holy texts talk about. Okay, so there is a way of actually seeing if the universe is indeed fractal to see what the snowman, the man that brought snowman for the entire universe looks like. And it's essentially basically what's happening on the planet. Okay, that's, that's the, the basic idea. Okay, so I'll stop the screen share. Okay, so, so now uh, the, the question is, once the, the end happens, what happens after that? If it does bounce this cosmic Christ and this kind of universal Vishnu, what happens? What's well, cyclical, it just starts all over again. So this kind of ancient Hindu idea, which is, I, I think it's completely right, okay, recurring idea in Hindu, and also some strands of uh, Shia Islam, that, the, that basically the, the, the universe, okay, basically derives from the body of God. So you have this thing called body of God, like, like Brahma, and that, uh, 
through the process of dissolution, the body of God is chopped up and becomes a universe. And then this is a process where basically the universe becomes the body of God again in an eternal cycle, which takes us to our fifth in our diagram, the idea of an oscillating universe. Okay, oscillating universe, endless oscillating universe. Now, Einstein entertained this idea, but he dropped it because the empirical evidence, there wasn't enough mass in the universe to, to uh, bring about the collapse back to a kind of oscillation. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, yeah. so he gave up the idea. Now, uh, what, what's happened is basically uh, there's something called dark energy, which has made this kind of idea. Unheard, or we can, yeah. That's the reason why uh, someone like Roger Penrose, who recently won the okay. Nobel Prize, has basically, uh, basically supports the idea of a cyclical universe. But it's not just Roger Penrose, there's actually quite a few physicists and in prominent uh, mainstream prestigious universities who basically champion the idea of an oscillating universe. And now there's the actual empirical evidence through dark energy to support it now. Okay, so now we, we, we take uh, everything we had in this diagram uh, to basically uh, okay. these, these five points. Okay, so we're gonna screen share back again. Okay, share that screen there. What, we're gonna, what we need to do now, okay, what we need to do now is to basically, okay, so the, the, these uh, these uh, kind of five points, basically, they all kind of click together, they all come together to form a picture of the universe, okay, so mathematical universe, illusory universe, fractal universe, purposeful universe, cyclical universe, to think, form a single composite picture, okay, so, so you can make this composite picture without any reference to a kind of mysticism or religion, and it has its own consistency. So you can take them as purely uh, kind of ideas in, in the kind of current scientific discourse. Now, not, not so that everyone or scientists agree with what I've said, there's competing ideas. But the main thing is these ideas are perfectly rationally, scientifically valid ideas. So it means for the 21st century, you can take these perfectly valid scientific ideas, click them together into a composite picture, which is identical to the picture of the universe uh, a fractal universe as above, so below, microcosm as macrocosm, that's presented in the esoteric mysteries, cyclical, purposeful, etc. Okay, now we're going to go to the next step. Okay, we're going to basically go to the next step and explain how these uh, ideas then allow us to really explain the ultimate mystery, which is consciousness. Okay, so, so consciousness is this huge uh, scientific puzzle now. It kind of began in uh, 1994 with the uh, kind of like the first towards a science of consciousness conference. I remember reading about it 20, uh, 20 or 25 years ago in the Scientific American magazine. I remember reading, it was, I remember the day I read it, and I was quite excited. And uh, it, it, a report from a staff writer, John Horgan, wrote about this conference in 1994. Big names were there, Francis Crick, Roger Penrose, David Chalmers began his famous philosopher became began his career there. Now, at the end of the conference, all the journalists from Time Magazine, Scientific American, all these the New York Times all got together in a huddle and it just discussed the conference. And it all came to the conclusion, they all agreed that no one knew what they're talking about. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what the, the, the state of the, the consciousness the investigation back then. And I was actually sponsored to attend the, the 20th anniversary in, in uh, 2014 by I money on this uh, conference. Uh, you know, I wouldn't spend my own money to oh. go to these conferences, but I was sponsored and I, I went. And at the end of the conference, there was a, a, the, oh, kind of like the, I'm a kind of analysis. Basically, th there was a kind of consensus. Okay, there was consensus on pan, uh, kind of like a panpsychism and it's thing called inf information, integrated information theory. But there's a consensus that hardly any progress has been made in the past 20 years. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty uh, dismal stuff, isn't it? So, so what we can do now is basically explain what using what we've already explained, just oh, really tackle on. the mystery of consciousness and the compelling and I hope I hope convincing, okay. Uh, uh, we're gonna do it in, in the most exquisite way because we're gonna do it in such a way whereby this explanation of consciousness completely converges with the definitions of the nature of God and all the mystical texts like the Corpus Medicum and all the mystical traditions and even the kind of mainstream texts like Quran, Bible and Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so so this is uh, this is very quite quite interesting. Uh, okay, so, so we've got to first explain, we've got, okay, we've got to first explain, go back to, okay, stop the share. Okay, we, we'll first explain what is the nature of God according to mainstream <coughs> What is the nature of God according to these mystical traditions? Okay. 
so there's like a recurring idea, okay, basically that God is inside you. Okay, so obviously in the Bible, the Christ within, any Bible basher will tell that Jesus is inside you, okay. And uh, the idea in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna within, the Buddha within, uh, in, in the Adi Granth, which the Sikh holy text, quote, the one God is, is all pervading and alone dwells in the mind. That's the key word, alone, dwelling in your mind. We can go on, uh, the Quran, Allah, close to you, Daniel, juggle a vein, that's pretty personal, isn't it? So God's inside you. And, and also in the outer inscriptions of the Temple of Luxor, uh, that somehow your body is the house of God. That's a God is inside you. Okay, that, that's what it's saying, these, uh, these religious uh, views, okay. The, the other view is that uh, the, the idea that um, God is inside you, but some, that God is one. Okay, so this is very important. I mean, this is the, the greatest commandment in Judaism, the Shema opens with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Okay, that's the greatest commandment. That's how it, that's how it begins. And Jesus asks, what's the greatest commandment? He recites, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So a very important idea that God is one and also central to Islam. And also uh, Hinduism. Okay, people think Hinduism is polyth polytheistic. But no, it's absolutely not, because there's a passage in Bhagavad Gita that the super soul, which is God inside you, appears divided, but is never divided, and is always situated as one. God is one. You see, uh, so the oneness of God is a recurring idea. <clears throat> in the Corpus Medicum, for there is only one soul, there's only one life, there's only one matter. Who is that? Who else can it be but the one God? So God is one. Okay, now, okay, that, that God is one, but somehow we're all one. In Christ, there's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no slave, there's no male, there's no female. For in Christ, we're all one. In the Quran, that you know, about a dozen of the chapters begins that God, Allah, has created you from a single self, a single soul. Now, there's a chapter called Luckman, a Syrah called Luckman, which goes, okay, this is a very cryptic passage. Your creation and your destruction is but that of a single self, not otherwise. Now, why do we think otherwise? We don't think, that here's my creation, eternal life, here's my resurrection, but that's someone else, I'm, I'm actually still dead. We, we never think that. We think otherwise when we think we're different people, you see, it's quite cryptic, it's batine, it's hidden, you see, it's oblique, it's kind of hidden, but if you decipher it, you can work out what it says. It's saying, basically, the one soul stays as being one soul. So somehow we are one, we are just kind of like, a, there's only one soul, it, it kind of explicitly said in the Corpus Medicum as well. Now, when we explore further, we get to the heart of the matter, basically when it's esoteric mysteries saying directly that somehow we are God, that the oneness that we are, that the oneness God is, is somehow one and the same. So the, the kind of uh, esoteric passages in say the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says, quote, drink from my mouth and you shall be as I, and I shall be as you, and the hidden things to you shall be revealed. The kind of mystical deep of uh, Muhammad, one example, Man is my mystery, and I am his mystery, for I am he himself, he is I myself. It's a very mystical kind of Sufi passages there. And uh, the, the Vajrayana deity yoga and, and Hinduism is very kind of like a very explicit Atman Brahman, it's one and the same. Okay. We, we can go on. So it's actually saying explicitly, essentially, that we are God. And in the Corpus Mescom, there's kind of dozens and dozens of passages which really reinforce the point and kind of Upanishads, the ancient Hindu uh, kind of uh, mystical texts, really just go over it again and, you know. So, so the puzzle is, how can this be the case? It's like a metaphysical conundrum. How, how can we possibly explain this? Well, we can. We're going to do it. We we'll do it now. We're going to explain how these, uh, you know, kind of like definitions of what is the nature of God can be explained using all the scientific ideas we've just uh, kind of been, been talking about. Okay. Now, now okay, this, this is how it goes. Okay. So, so we're going to swap to philosophic language. Okay. So now... Okay, the mystery of consciousness. I'm going to show that the mystery of consciousness and the mystery of God are one and the same. Okay, so we explain the kind of like uh, the, the facets of the mystery of God, the oneness and that we are, and some of that we are God. Okay, now, now this is the puzzle. Now, how do we show convincingly, or, or how can we show compellingly, whether it's convincing or not to, you know, different people convinced or not? That's, that's, not, that's, that's out of our control, isn't it? Look, how can we explain con compellingly? This uh, the, the central truth of the nature of God, but okay, it goes like this. Okay, so the explanation of consciousness, consciousness goes like this. You can only ever know one consciousness. Okay, so following from Descartes, Immanuel Kant, you only can only know your consciousness. That's the only thing you can ever know, and you can only know one consciousness. You've only ever known one consciousness. You can never get out of yourself. That's the only thing you can ever know. Everything is mediated through mediated through that one consciousness. 
cogito ergo sum, all your thoughts are mediated through that one consciousness. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the absolute, the only assumption you can have absolute certainty of. I'm just basically retracing the kind of uh, Immanuel Kant and Rene Descartes reasoning. Okay, this is how it goes. Okay, so basically, basically, if the universe is mathematical, okay, and it's illusory, basically, so kind of, kind of, essay es percipe, George Berkeley's famous quote, to be is to be perceived. Now we have another metaphor from the 21st century, or 20th, 21st century of virtual reality. Okay, so imagine that universe, yes, is a simulation, but it doesn't, you're not simulating the actual movement of the molecules and stuff, you're just simulating the perception of a physical universe. So to be is to be perceived, like a virtual reality screen. You, you don't, you know, touch the computer screen thinking, you know, your, your first person shooter thinking you can touch the objects. Basically you have mathematical objects in the computer and it renders a virtual reality. So the basic idea is you have this logos, you have this kind of, you have this kind of mathematical equation that describes not just this universe, but every single possible universe that can possibly be. And what it renders is first person subjective reality. So that's me looking at you now. Okay, this works better in a, in a live public speaking context. This is me looking at you now. This is you looking at me in, into the computer screen. So that's first person subjective reality. That's consciousness. Okay, so basically the, what, that's what's being rendered, your first person subjective reality. Okay, like a, like a virtual reality screen. Okay, now, okay, this is the, the crucial bit. Okay, there's only one consciousness, but I have to account for all the other consciousnesses out there. And there's lots of consciousnesses, aren't there? The universe is huge, isn't it? As we saw earlier on. Okay, so, so okay, if I thought there's only one consciousness, I need to account for every other consciousness. If I can't do that, okay, if basically I thought only I was conscious, only I feel pleasure and pain and no one else does, no one is conscious, then I'd be a goddamn psychopath, wouldn't I? <laughs> okay, or like, a, like an Ayn Rand superhero. Okay, sorry, I don't mean to dig at Ayn Rand again. But last week. Okay, look, okay, look, look, basically I need to account for the idea that there's only one consciousness, undivided, indivisible, and there's billions and zillions of consciousnesses out there. So how do I do that? Well, the answer is utterly simple. When you see how utterly simple it is, it's parsimonious. It's actually a good property of science. It's utterly, utterly simple. And it goes like this. Okay, it goes this, okay. Imagine block universe, the universe from beginning to end. Okay, so basically block universe, a, a cosmic cycle from the big bang to the end of the universe, cosmic Christ, universal Vishnu. Okay, that's, that's, that's a, a term that physicists use. Now imagine every sentient being in this block universe from beginning to end, okay? Uh, human, every human being, every alien in all the stars in the sky, billions and zillions of stars, all the kind of like life forms that are galaxies, life forms that are planets, the life forms that are human beings uh, on a human level, the life forms that are, uh, you know, on a pan-galactic level, level and the ultimate life form whose body is the entire universe. Now imagine that all these are in the block universe. Now, okay, another diagram now just to explain the points. Okay, so this is obviously schematic because I can't draw the entire universe in a simple little diagram. Okay, so, so this is how it goes. Okay, so this is the explanation for how we're all one consciousness. Now, now you see this diagram here. These are like a fra these are like normal Russian dolls, but this is different. This is like a fractally nested Russian doll. And you can keep zooming in. Can, I can zoom into this other Russian doll. Keep, keep zooming in like the Mandelbrot set. Now imagine that this is what this is the actual Russian doll is the entire universe, and the, the biggest Russian doll is the cosmic Christ and the universal Vishnu. So obviously this diagram is very schematic. The universe is far is huge, as we saw with the Lanayaka thing. It's massive, isn't it? It's completely humongous. Okay, so imagine that basically every single life form in the universe, beginning to end, is in this Russian doll. Okay. So some of these small Russian dolls, these might be human beings, okay? And these might be life forms whose body is the entire planets. And these might be life forms whose body is entire galaxies. And these might be life forms whose body is our entire sheets of galaxies. And that's the cosmic Christ universal Vishnu. Now, so these are all sentient beings with consciousness. So how, is, how are all these beings conscious and the one consciousness is indivisible and God is indivisible at the same time. And the answer is shockingly simple. And it's just so shockingly simple that it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be, uh, yeah, it's gonna be, it will seem kind of strange. But simply you, you take this Russian doll and you take all the Russian dolls and you simply string onto a single thread. So you see every single Russian doll I see, you see here is also found in a single chain. You see, it's a chain of being, it's a new cosmic chain of being. 
that sounds insane, doesn't it? But the main thing is like the main thing is like at any point on this chain, any of these Russian dolls can experience itself as being the entire universe, undivided, indivisible. And it's not illusory; it's actually the way it is. Now, obviously, this diagram is very schematic. It's basically uh, the universe is huge. It's, you know, Lanaika and that kind of business. But you see, this diagram just illustrate the point that each of these sentient beings basically is on a chain. But the, at each point of the chain, they are the totality of all existence. So each Russian doll unfolds into a string, and that's a life form from beginning to end. It just means all the strings are joined end to end to make a very long string. Now, that's a completely wild conception of reality, isn't it? It's completely wild. But what is that? If it is a single chain of transmigration, then what is that? Well, that isn't that not reincarnation? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, basically, uh, you know, so as we sleep and awaken to a new day, so does cosmic being dies and awaken to a new life. And I have to add at this point that basically reincarnation is the common truth behind all the esoteric mysteries of the world. OK, so, you know, like a Kabbalah in the Zohar, explicit in, in the course of Medicum, explicit mentions of reincarnation. Obviously, Hinduism, Buddhism, obviously, uh, rebirth. This explains that the puzzle of rebirth is, is, is there's no individuated soul rebirthing, basically, or reincarnating. It's just, it's just, it's just basically God or the, the void or Buddha nature. And, uh, okay, the, all, all the kind of Muslim Shiite, Shiite sects, all the Sufi orders, they all, they, generally they believe in reincarnation. Most of the Shiite sects do believe in reincarnation. The Druze, the Levi, the Levites, the Yazidi, the Ishmaeli. Uh, you know, Sufis, uh, uh, the kind of like uh, Al Halaj and Rumi, most of the kind of uh, a lot of the poetry is reincarnation poetry. So, so basically, reincarnation is like this universal truth. Now, now some of you are saying, but how? Christianity doesn't believe in reincarnation, so this is not so universal, is it? Well, no, no, what happened was, okay, that something happened in 553 AD. It's called the Second Council of Constantinople, okay. So what happened in 553 AD in the Second Council of Constantinople? I'll stop the screen share. Okay, what happened was that, okay, this is what happened. The Emperor Justinian basically decided that Roman subjects should be, quote, given one life only and then heaven or hell. Not because he was some metaphysical, you know, kind of speculator or theorist, but because he thought Roman citizens would be more obedient if they're given one life only than heaven or hell. Okay. Pope Vigilius, the Pope at the time, boycotted the votes because it was loaded with people who were against reincarnation. And I'm not saying reincarnation was universally believed before the Second Council of Constantinople, but it was an idea which was believed by many Christians, not just a kind of like um, kind of lay congregation or a kind of business. Church fathers like Clement, uh, Saint Jerome, Justin Martyr, and Norbius. Uh, St. Gregory and Oregon. I, I mean, the, 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 uh, the uh, position of reincarnation was called Oregonism, and Oregon is the greatest of the church fathers. So it was actually a very current idea. Reincarnation was very prominent within early Christianity. It was banned. So when Christians say, we Christians don't believe in reincarnation, you can just say, look, there's an intervention of a Roman emperor who just wanted you to behave, okay? It just means that there's this universal truth. It's not just uh, esoteric mysteries or Ashkenazism, Rastafarianism, Druidism, Corpus Mescum. Basically, when you couple this universal truth with these scientific truths, there is a basic simple explanation of how the, the one soul is undivided and how we're all one. Now, I, I, if you said that what I've just said about the, you know, the great chain of beings, it sounds completely insane. Then I totally agree with you. Okay, I totally agree. It sounds completely mad, but it is absolutely reasonable. It's absolutely parsimonious and it's absolutely logically consistent. Okay. In fact, I could have said, I could have said everything about you know, the, the, the cosmological model and this great chain of being without any reference to reincarnation or kind of mystical ideas at all. And it has its own consistency. And it's basically a way of looking at the universe. It's a metaphysical view of things that relies on the only assumption you can ever, ever possibly know, one consciousness. So it's a kind of simple parsimony to it, do you see? Okay, so, so that is really the explanation of consciousness. And I know some of you people are thinking, this is insane, but if, if, you know, if I'm God, what the hell am I listening to you, Wade? Uh, you know, listen to this funny guy explain to me who I am. Okay, the, the simple answer is, it's because you've got the time on your hands to do it. Okay, time, eternity is a very, very long time. Okay, it, it goes on and on. Okay, there's a Sufi, Persian Sufi parable, and it goes like this. Okay, it's a very ancient Sufi parable to explain the nature of eternity. Okay. 
basically, uh, there is a diamond mountain. It's a mountain made of diamond, okay? And there's a bird, there's a, myth, there's a bird, a mythic bird, and it basically flies over the mountain and it drops a single tear on the mountain, a water, watery tear on the mountain. They try, it goes for a million, a million years in a circuit for a million years. And a million years later, it comes back to the mountain and it sheds another tear. And then it goes for another million years, another circuit, it sheds another tear. Then eventually the mountain is worn to nothing by the water. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's gonna take bloody ages. But that's the point. Eternity is a very, very long time. And when you see eternity in this way, it kind of makes sense that basically, instead of we as finite mortal beings trying to do as much we can, as we can in the shortest possible time, as God, we're trying to do the least we can in the most time. Okay, so that's, that's another way of looking at things. So, so basically, this uh, idea needs to be kind of uh, supplemented with supporting ideas. It's like being told, it's like being told if you believe that the earth was still and the sun revo revolved around the earth, okay, like people did, and then you were suddenly told that it is the earth revolving at thousands of miles an hour, and there's always assumptions you have, like, oh, I'll fall off the earth, and oh, there'd be a massive kind of breeze, wouldn't there, if I was, so there's always kind of like assumptions we have that are intuitive, which, which would have stopped people at that time seeing how the, the earth can revolve around the sun at thousands of miles an hour, and there's also assumptions which can stop people from seeing how we're God. Okay, so there's lots of stuff to supplement that basic idea I've just explained. Okay, so that's the insane but perfectly reasonable idea explained. Are there any questions at this point? Any questions? Unmute yourselves and then ask a question or I'll just crack on if not. Okay, the next riveting part is to do with uh, magic and mysticism and, uh, and prophecies and mythology. So if there's no questions, I'll just crack on. No one's unmuting themselves. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Okay, you can ask questions at the end as well. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to just um, fairly quickly, we, we, this has been quite a long talk, isn't it? We're going to fairly quickly explain the rest of the esoteric mysteries. Okay, so now we're going to explain the rest of the esoteric mysteries. Okay, so we're going to basically do it. Okay, so what I want to do now is do another screen share. And uh, so back to, uh, okay, so, so um, the uh, okay, so so we will basically explain the the, the 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 diagram here, haven't we? The top part, mysticism and religious experience. It just means that uh, yes, we are this kind of god asleep in our bodies, but there is a kind of like enlightenment experience of being awake, and that we kind of become one with God. We kind of return to the state before the fall, according to the Corpus Medicum, and we become one in God. Okay, so that's basically a, a mysticism, a mystical religious experience. So we kind of explained. This part of the diagram that we basically there's a way of looking at reality and metaphysics in the universe and that really uh through science that shows that we are indeed you know god that basically it's not a mis it's not like a illusory experience it's just to see things as they really are okay so now we're going to explain the bottom two parts of this diagram which is essentially the rest of the esoteric religion and the prisca theologia we're going to explain the rest of it and we kind of talked about magic kind of fairly superficially how it was about uh, technology and science gaining power and, and entering into the powers, becoming the powers and becoming into God through kind of empowering yourself through science and technology. But we're gonna go, we're gonna do a deeper dive into the nature of magic now. Okay, so, so you know, witches, wizards, warlocks, what does it mean? Okay, magi, magus, what, what, what does it actually mean then? Okay, so stop share, back to, okay, back to, what it means, okay, basically, the, the, okay, what is magic? Okay, basically, magic is about manifesting things okay so it's about mind and manifestation so abracadabra i know it sounds a stage magic expression it sounds like ridiculous isn't it you give me a you give me a kind of like a talk about religion and you're saying ab abracadabra now, abr abracadabra had a meaning okay it had a, it's an aramaic hebrew expression okay basically it means literally as i speak so i create and what it means is that basically you have something in mind you can speak it Bring it out into the physical world and it can manifest that thing into the physical world okay so that's like the basic idea now to illustrate look if i wanted to manifest an ice cream okay my daughters love ice cream if i want to man manifest an ice cream basically i need to keep that idea in mind don't i i need discipline i need to basically focus on the idea if i if i don't keep the idea in mind then I, then I don't get my ice cream i walk to the shop oh i, I forgot to get the ice cream okay You've got to keep the idea in mind that there's a certain level of discipline involved and there's a certain amount of knowledge you need to learn, know how to cross the road without getting run over so 
now that's an utterly trite example of getting ice cream, basically the knowledge to get an ice cream, the discipline to get an ice cream. Now I say it in order to illustrate the fundamental idea of what magic is, it's absolutely general and fundamental. Okay, now, now we go from ice cream to say manifesting a career, manifesting a kind of nice life, manifesting a job promotion, manifesting a kind of manifesting a work of art, manifesting a sculpture, manifesting a cathedral like the Renaissance men did, Christopher Wren, manifesting a new world order. To do all those things, you need discipline. You need to master science, technology, cross over the road, basic facts and basic skills. And you need focus. You need to keep the, the goal in mind to manifest it. Okay, that's kind of so ABC, isn't it? That's so, that's just basically so simple. Now, okay, now, we explained that there is a highly mysterious dimension to magic in a minute. Okay. At the same time, look, ice cream, in order to build a great cathedral, in order to build a new world order, in order to launch revolutions or build a new world, you need to feed yourself. So you need to get ice creams, you need to get food. Okay. So all the little kind of like bits of magic add up to bigger bits of magic to add up to grand tasks. Okay. Okay. Now, now in, in America, in America, basically America is a very mystical country because it's basically where a lot of apocalyptic Puritans and also Freemasons and also people escaping religious persecution for having wacky kind of religious ideas went. So there's something about the American uh, kind of uh, culture. There's a huge undercurrent of religiosity and mysticism in uh, lurking underneath America. Now, now there's, there's a thing called New Thought. New Thought movement is a kind of like very powerful movement in America. And uh, the, the the one line which illustrates what New Thought is, is, is that it's, it's, it's called a power of positive thinking. This idea you can you manifest things manifest things through thinking positively. Now it's gone to all kinds of directions. It can manifest health. You can manifest away disease uh, through through positive thinking, healthy bodies and stuff. And it's very powerful movement in America. Okay, the, there's a very mystical connection because the 1957 uh, declaration of the New Thought Alliance in America said as one of its beliefs, uh, quote, the inseparable oneness of God and man. So there's a very kind of mystical undercurrent to the New Thought movement. The one of the most famous uh, kind of proponents of New Thought was a guy who actually wrote one of the best-selling self-help books of all time, The Power of Positive Thinking. Okay, his name is Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. He, now, he, he was a pastor in a New York church. He also happened to be a master Freemason. Okay, now back in the 50s and 60s, he had a church in New York and basically he gave these amazing sermons, amazing self-help book, Power of Positive Thinking. And there was a family from Brooklyn who came to his uh, sermons, okay, and uh, the, the, the family brought their kids along. And there's one there's a little, little boy who listened to the sermons. He was enraptured. He loved the sermons. He basically, in his adult life, he said, yeah, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's lectures were amazing. And when it ended, he just wanted them to go on and on. Okay, now that little boy's name is Donald Trump. Okay, so uh, it's a small world, isn't it? So Donald Trump was influenced by this power of positive thinking. So, so basically, the power of positive thinking works even if you lie and cheat, okay, so, to an extent. Okay, so basically, made this incredible empire became president of the United States. Now, the power of positive thinking doesn't work against COVID. So you can understand when Donald Trump says, "Oh, poof, it's going to go away." You know, two months now, COVID is going to go away. That is from Do Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. So it doesn't work just based on positive thinking. You need a bit of science, you need a bit of technology, and you need a bit of discipline and work. Okay, so, okay, so, so the, now this power of positive thinking thing also found its way into the new age. This magic, this magic uh, idea of manifestation also found its way into the new age, and it's the idea of um, of law of attraction. Okay, so basically, uh, the idea of law of attraction. I used to work in the center, uh, this, this church for ten years, and it was real center of new age. They had a it was a separate organization, but I used the church to, to give lectures. And I really got to know the new age very well. But anyway, uh, the law of attraction, you get these kind of like uh, really these new age gurus and they tell you, you manifest Mercedes Benz and uh, anything you want, BMW, perfect, perfect relationship, uh, your, your dream job, a yacht, you know, manifest money, think money will come from the post, it will come from the post. And there's a sucker born every minute. And if you don't get your Mercedes Benz, do my kind of a uh, law of attraction workshop, extra strength for more money. And then if that doesn't work, do my triple strength workshop and I'm laughing to the bank. Okay. Now, law of attraction is something very influential, but it's something which is, I, I, you know, if two people wanted to manifest 
you know, both win the next, tomorrow's lottery. It's not going to happen. So basically, there's something quite limited. And I, I think people who buy into this kind of law of, law of attraction, I think I think they're really uh, just getting, you know, kind of ripped off. Really, I think that's my opinion. Okay, it's like, uh, really, my my experience of the new age was quite. I mean, like, it's like new age tantra. You know, it's, it's kind of debased. I mean, there is magic, there is Renaissance magic, and there is kind of real power of positive thinking. But it's kind of debased, kind of the version of it in law of attraction. It's like new age tantra. I mean, it's almost like degenerates into basically you, 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 you get a couple basically, this is, you know, like you basically you, you, you were a bindi on your forehead. You basically burn some incense. You play some Indian music and uh, you order an Indian takeaway. And uh, the man calls the woman Shakti. The woman calls the man Shiva. And then you have sex. OK, OK, I'm, I'm being I'm kind of like a caricaturing the kind of new age tantra, but it's not totally far from the truth. OK, so it's basically there's a kind of debasement of these kind of like like a like higher truths that, but then what is the truth what is the mysterious dimension to law of attraction or the uh, kind of power of positive thinking and to magic what is it then I, i'll tell you what it is okay if there is really if there is really a kind of like a destiny wave function it means that basically the destiny of the universe but also historical destiny is being pulled to a set conclusion it means that in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives, it means that dice are loaded and it will manifest themselves as synchronicities, chance happenings that are not chance because the dice are loaded to make this thing happen. So it's, things are not random, it seems. What I think the real law of attraction, the real power of magic is this, it's not about what you want. It's not about wanting a Mercedes Benz or you know, perfect relationship. Of course we want those things, but we have to work for those things. You can't just you know, ask the universe for those things. The universe might not specifically care whether you're Mercedes Benz or BMW, but the universe does care about certain things happening because the destiny wave function is pulling the destiny of the universe to those things happening. The real power of magic is when you can align your will, your purpose to the will of the universe and a historical purpose. If that happens, then things will happen around you to realize your destiny and your will against all odds because the destiny wave function has, is gonna pull all the things around you to happen or the dice will be loaded to make your personal destiny happen because your personal destiny is needed to realize the historic destiny. And when that happens, basically, there's no power on earth that can stop you because it's already been preordained. It's like almost like a divine intervention, okay? Now, historically, when these things happen, they're so remarkable that these the people who do these remarkable things, they do great things, their lives are seen as numinous, they seem as, they seem so special that the, their life stories, what they achieve, becomes mythologized. Okay, because it's almost like the hand of God was influencing their lives. The dice were so loaded that their, their stories get told not just over the generations, but over the centuries, over the millennia. Okay, and they become like mythic. Yeah, they become mythologized. They become mythic heroes. Okay. Now we're going to go to our next point in our diagram, uh, mythology. Okay, now there's a guy uh, called Joseph Campbell. Now he assembled all these stories from the world, these myths, these semi-historic kind of like semi-fictional kind of stories that he believes is rooted in real people. The, these stories from all around the world, uh, King Arthur, Odysseus, Quaxacoto, all these kind of different myth mythologized yellow emperor, all these different myths from around the world. And he, he formulated this monomyth, this idea of a monomyth. He basically said, and he basically put forward the argument that all these myths were basically telling the same basic story. And he also fitted in his interpretation, the story of Jesus, Buddha and Muhammad in the same framework. Okay, I, I don't need to tell you what the story is because you know it, you know it from, modern myths like Star Wars, Dune, and The Matrix. Okay, now am I overstating the connection between Joseph Campbell's monomyth and Star Wars? Well, no, no, absolutely not, because Joseph Campbell says the monomyth needed to be communicated to every new generation to inspire the, the, the future generations, okay? And he said that George Lucas had done this. And George Lucas in many interviews said, basically as he was writing Star Wars, his intention was to communicate the monomyth, actually referenced Joseph Campbell. Later on, they, get, got, they got to know each other and, uh, and, and, and uh, became friends. So, so basically there is this basic storyline where, where basically the mythic quest hero, literally it's almost like is a practitioner of magic and basically almost like the force realizes this basic storyline. Okay, now the basic storyline is, 
it's, it's basically the, the story that is, is repeated that you, that you basically know. Now, there's a relationship between myth and prophecy because, okay, the Roman philosopher Sallustius, he said that myths are things which never happen, but they always are. Now, Star Wars never happened, Lord of the Rings never happened. Okay, they're, they're, it's fantasy, it's fiction, basically. But they, these myths communicate a transcendent archetype, but that transcendent archetype manifests into reality. And that's why they become these kind of historical characters. Now, the prophecies are essentially about that same basic mythic archetype manifesting on a global scale. But if you think about it, there really is a relationship between myth and prophecy because inherent in the myths, in the idea of the myth cycle, is that the, the hero keeps returning. Okay, so it's a recurring thing, but it happens on, a, on bigger scales. And if, if um, Joseph Campbell puts Jesus, Muhammad and Buddha in the context of myth and myth cycle, then basically they return. Second coming, Betraya, Imam Mahdi. But it keeps returning. You know, fundamentalist Christians will say Jesus is unique and then there's a second coming. But no, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is like Melchizedek. So there's a predecessor like Jesus and probably no one behind that. So it's a great chain as it manifests all over the planet. Okay. But the prophecies are saying that this mythic archetype will manifest on a global scale. So all the prophecies talk about the book of Revelation uh, uses the word earth 40 times, the, the word world eight times, the expression whole world four times. So it's really a global happening. Calcia avatar, world avatar, Zoroastrian world benefactor, world renovator. It's a really a world event. So the idea is basically uh, the mythic archetype is manifesting in present times. Now back to science. Okay. If if it is the case that basically um, this, 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 this apocalypse of uh, kind of chaos, destruction and uh, annihilation, in, 20, in 2019, the end of 2019, uh, 11,000 scientists put their name to a joint letter. And the joint letter said basically that global warming, ecological uh, destruction, climate change, it, climate change is happening far faster than we thought. And they use expressions like, it's threatening the very fate of humanity, quote, unquote. They use expressions like untold human suffering is going to occur, quote, unquote. It's almost like biblical, isn't it? Is that so it's different from saying, you know, biblical language, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's really like, like the, you know, the ecological, environmental catastrophe, catastrophe befalling us. It is biblical. It does seem apocalyptic. Okay, um, so, so in a sense, uh, scientists are seen as kind of like, a, you know, kind of real kind of like writing on the wall to use more kind of biblical language. Now, the, the word apocalypse literally means unveiling of the hidden thing. Okay, that's what it literally means. What is this hidden thing, if not the hidden truth behind world religion, the esoteric mysteries? But if it is the case that there is this progression through history, the kind of the the kind of like imagery of the scroll of the seven seals in the Book of Revelation, over time, over historical events, the, the kind of like seals on the scrolls, uh, on the scroll is, is uh, taken off, and then at the end of time, all the, the seals are taken off, and then the, the truth is revealed. That's apocalypse. What if it's the case that it is through the progression of science that basically it comes to a point where in time when we can fully explain the esoteric mysteries in completely perfectly plain language without recourse to metaphor or parable. So that's what we think is the case. So in, in a sense, what science has done, it's not my revelation, it's basically a, an interpretation of progression of science. That science started by the Renaissance man has led to a point of apocalypse, genuine real deal bona fide apocalypse, the unveiling of the hidden thing in completely rational scientific language. Okay, so that's another interpretation of apocalypse. Now, okay, just to finish the talk, okay, just go back to my diagrams again. Okay, just to say, so, so if it is the case, if that is the case of a uh, kind of, uh, okay, share the screen, I've got, I've got to do share here. Um, I'll, I'll take that window off so I can move the diagram. Um, okay, so, so, so basically, uh, if it's the case that like, this diagram just shows the kind of like what's happening, the kind of global warming, all these things that we want being destroyed, the fisheries, the kind of rainforest all being destroyed, what, what's problematic, uh, kind of like global warming, all kind of going up. But what, what if it's the case that this intervention called the technological singularity, okay, technological singularity is the advent of artificial intelligence. Okay, 
the technological singularity is so profound. The advent of artificial intelligence is so profound. It's been called apocalypticism for nerds. It's been called rapture for geeks. The, 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 the coming of artificial intelligence, the ultimate technology and the ultimate manifestation of uh, what began the Renaissance, the ultimate technology, is, is like a phase shift in, on the evolution of the planet. It's basically a complete transformation of the world leading to kind of like, you know, space exploration, uh, kind of life extension, all these kind of amazing technologies emerging in a very short space of time. So what we think is that basically uh, all these uh, kind of apocalypses are happening now. And if uh, technologists are saying, using language like Elon Musk saying, the tech, you know, AI is like summoning the demon, uh, a joint letter by Stephen Hawking, uh, Max Tegmark and Stuart Russell, uh, they called the advent of artificial intelligence, the technological singularity, a quote, the biggest event in human history. The biggest event in human history, but isn't that what the prophecies are about? So there's actually an interpretation of what, what's happening in science and technology, which is actually, you know, to the technological scientific mind, is actually sounding biblical. If technologists and kind of like uh, scientists are using biblical mythic language to describe the current situation anyway, then it's not really so far-fetched to suggest that what technologists and scientists are talking about is exactly the same as what religion is talking about. Okay, so that's a kind of like a convergence, another convergence in terms of interpreting what's happening in the world today. So there you have it. It means that basically there was, there was a process that began in the Renaissance uh, where science and technology began and the original Re Renaissance men, the uh, members of the Invisible College, what they were really about, they were really about using science to will gain redemption and get themselves to the state before the fall but they're also using science to understand god okay they thought basically science would understand allow them to understand the nature of god okay and and it means that basically that process which began in the renaissance and also the process of technology has come to a point now of apocalypse when these ideas of the corpus medicum can be totally ex be explained in scientific language and this progression of technology has come to a point very soon where the ultimate technology is going to be manifest. And that is a conclusion of a, of a massive time cycle that perhaps began since the beginning of human history. So I think uh, basically what's on the cards is, you know, we have this plague, COVID. So what I, I think like the Renaissance, after the plague comes the Renaissance. And after COVID comes the new Renaissance. That if we can make magic great again, then we can make the world great again. We can make England, Europe great again. We can make America great again. Where have I heard that before? We can make the, yeah, we can make everyone, the, the world, and the, basically the progression of history, we can take it to its conclusion and, and take uh, basically history to the next phase. Okay, so I, I, I guess that's it. I guess that's it. I could, I could go on. Oh my God, I've gone on for an hour and a half. You know, 90 minutes is kind of like a, a good, you know, kind of span of human attention. My God, you guys are so patient. You've concentrated for all that time. You've not kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of like a uh, dogged off. That's great. So, so guys, I mean, basically, that is the, basically. If you got any questions, I'm here until the end of time to answer your questions. But you got me right now to answer your questions. So, if there's any questions, I will okay. answer them. One question. Uh, oh, turn the volume. I can't hear. Okay, can one question. Me? Can you hear me? Why? Is it Anton? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I said you now. Okay. 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 okay just work. I mean, you're, um, it seems to me that is uh, also very close to the Yugas, you know, Manvantara. It's, it's, uh, it seems that we are going to the final of the cycle, you know, the Kali Yuga. And uh, my question is, it seems, I hope so, no, that it's quite optimistic, but what is your idea about the dark, the dark uh, force of such cycle? Oh, okay, that's that's a really good question. It's almost like saying, well, what, what's the nature of evil? No, that's, that's that's the most important question. You know, if you're talking Star Wars, then what is the dark side? What is the nature of it? But basically, what it is, I think there there are doctrines and there are kind of like ideas in this world which are kind of uh, which lead to suffering and evil and lead to annihilation, really. And uh, and I think basically, obviously, if you're destroying the planet, you're destroying the very roots of your sustenance. That's going to lead to profound human suffering. And there's ideologies of selfishness and, you know, kind of like uh, 
uh, you know, basically isolation and basically oppression and basically not recognizing the kind of like well-being of other people. These doctrines are dominant in, in even future, like in the last talk, you know, scientific doctrines of genocide that were justified in the 20th century make resurgence. That is the dark side. So basically, you know, you know, evil and good are not relative. Basically, you know, good leads to life, prosperity, happiness. You know, evil leads to death, suffering and misery. They're not relative, you know what I'm saying? There is, there is a cosmic battle. And basically, if the battle is won by evil, there's death and destruction and annihilation and oblivion, that's what it is. If the battle is won by good, there is life, there's prosperity, there is a future. So I think there are, I don't want to point fingers, there are forces of darkness in this world and there's going to be a struggle. There's going to be a, a cosmic struggle. And uh, relating to the last talk, part of the battle is in terms of worldview. But part of the battle is going to, once this worldview, which I envisage, you know, gains prominence and gains attention, they're going to people who want to, want to destroy the challenging worldview. So I think there's going to be a battle of ideas, but I think there's going to be, you know, real struggle ahead. And this is what the prophecies are about. There's going to be Darth Vader's and there's going to be stormtroopers and there's going to be rebels and Luke Skywalkers. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I, don't want, I don't want to point any fingers. I don't want to say you, evil. You bad because I don't want to get killed immediately. Basically, okay. No, no, I'm kidding. But no, I'm not kidding. I'm not very serious. Okay, so basically, you just want to walk the tightrope carefully on this one. Okay, so yeah, there, there are evil forces. Okay. Any, any other questions? Any other questions? That was a deep. Oh, guys, a big question. Evil nature of evil. That's a big one. Any other questions? Um, have you, you know the story about the Tower of Babel? Who's that? Is that Cory? Uh, Robert, I'm Robert. Oh, well, Robert, um, Robert. If I get you, are you are you on camera or was it just a voice? Uh, I, I can do the camera. Oh, um, I was curious about um, the Tower of Babel. Sure. Um, so, do you think that applies to the, um, uh, you know, that that idea about that technological singularity? Oh. Um, okay. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering because you're saying. Uh, like the the um, hermetics believe we're kind of like God and we're we're moving towards God and there's that if we're building a big huge global hive mind using um, you know cyborg implants or nano dust or whatever doesn't that sound like the Tower of Babel and do you think there's some kind of a process that will interrupt that? Okay, uh, what what I there's this idea of a kind of like a one world order that's a tyrannical one world order that's going to be that's what we're avoiding you know basically that's what the people in this world who don't want to be kings of the world they want to dominate the entire world you know there are people who think like that okay now the the, the schism of babel is a very powerful uh, myth and i think there's some there's a reality but it's also this idea of healing the schism of babel that eventually the languages of the, these kind of divided tongues will be unified into one language Surely communication is a good thing that people can communicate, communicate basically. This is a very powerful idea that's actually pre-Renaissance and uh, came from this guy called Riemann Lull and this idea of a universal perfect language. And they believe that there was this universal perfect language that's spoken, this is mythic, in the Garden of Eden, okay? So basically there is this kind of like perfect universal language. And they pursued this universal perfect language because they thought it would bring peace in the world. So, so I think, you know, like even like Google Translate, we can, if you can translate us into one communicating sphere, I think that's one way of actually bringing peace and understanding. But I think, I think in terms of like uh, the use of technology to control minds, I think that's one of the evils we are facing. So I think, I think you know, really there are forces that be, if this, if this battle isn't won, then once the tyranny using this technology is in place, then it's in place forever. Did, did you get it? So basically, I think basically that we should come together as one in peace, but it's the, the structure of that organization. Is it basically something like uh, that benefits everyone or is it something that, something that benefits the kind of, you know, the, the fraction of the 1%? So that's the, the kind of battle. So, so I believe, yes, I believe that healing the schism of Babel, you know, kind of like uh, taking us back to the condition before the fall, these are kind of like very good things building utopias but it's, it's basically who defines what a utopia is and basically then the struggle to actually make it so so i think that is the struggle ahead of us so it's, yes yes it, it, you know healing the schism of babel and building this kind of unified one one world can either be a very bad thing or can be a very good thing that's the struggle if we, we lose the battle that's a very bad thing if we win 
then it could be something very, very good. You know, in the Bible, if, if, you know, oh man, if you could heal the schism of Babel, if you can speak of one tongue, one united tongue, the things you could achieve, we could explore the stars. We can, you know, basically colonize the galaxy. You know what I'm saying? We can do amazing things. And that's the struggle ahead. That's part of it. It's kind of like, I sound like conspiracy theorists, aren't they? The one world order. But it's true. You know, there are people in this world who want to be masters of, the, of all humanity, I think. You know, full spectrum dominance and that kind of stuff, not just in America, but you know, Europe, China, there are basically this is kind of male mentality, which is basically what's the dominate, dominate, dominate. Okay, so does that answer your question? Any other questions? Any other questions out there? Thank you. Okay, great, great. Any other questions? Have yeah, you? so who's that? Um, Banks. Oh, Banks, uh, do you want to come on camera? Or do you just want to have a yeah? I think I'm on camera at the moment. Oh, I can't find you. Where, where, are you. where are you? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I oh. don't know if you can see me now. Oh, oh, oh you mean Naya? Well, me. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. There you, there you go. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, go for it, man. I, I, I just forget what names on display. Um, apologies. Uh, no, but no, yeah, no. um, I've got a question. But before I ask that, I just wanted to say something to. Um, the last speaker regarding the, the Tower of Babel uh, myth, um, there's an aspect of it that, that doesn't really get discussed much and it's about the fact that the people who were doing that building were doing this to glorify themselves and that the gods, because this wasn't a singular god, it was a, these deities uh, discussing amongst themselves as per, oh look at what these humans are doing and it was about like showing them that they had the wrong purpose for what they were doing was why the gods smited uh, and, you know, changed their language and cost whatever uh, cost, you know, that to, to not work. So it's about having the right purpose in unification would be a better approach to whatever that was supposed to be. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so that, what that says to me is, whatever we're trying to do revolution wise needs to come from a place where individuals have lost their sort of typical attitude towards life as but you know greed you know capitalism all these sort of things that that usually drive our, yeah, yeah, our yeah. ideas yeah um we, 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 so, we kind of covered this in the last talk we kind of covered this about to do with world views and how different world views kind of support ideas of greed or selfishness or selflessness and uh, charity so we kind of like covered this a lot. So you know, if you, you know, man, check out the last talk. I really just go into this in quite some detail. But do you have, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, question yeah. So my question is: so I'm originally from Nigeria, okay. And I, I presently am. I started to participate in this group that's uh, sort of a youth movement that's trying to to um, bring about change in in the nation. And uh, right. it's really it's really tough to sort of figure out where to fit in because I I I'm just sort of observing at the moment and. From being a part of that and being a part of this, I, I sort of I can see a really large chasm to use one of your words. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, especially with uh, this feels to me like you, a lot of people participating in this right now are, are familiar with your ideas and you know wouldn't necessarily disagree with any of it. But I feel like I can't quite see a way to. There's a need to to somehow disseminate this further. There's a need in the group I'm in. For people yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. follow your stuff, for example, um, but I don't. I, I, it seems to be a really large gap to bridge. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I'm yeah. not quite sure how to to yeah. um, proceed with that. If if you get my, oh, my okay. question, first I'll say basically that uh, yeah, I mean, young people, you know, a staggering statistic that basically forty one percent of all the people on this planet is under the age twenty four. And the, the, in the next 20, 30 years, there's going to be another two, three billion people coming on this planet, and they're all going to be young people. There's a huge mass of young people coming. Now, with respect to the, this, this idea of these esoteric truths, kind of like uh, forming revolutionary movements, what we showed in the last talk was basically that uh, these uh, kind of essentially secret societies like Freemasonry, like the Tudor Society in Germany, uh, they really spearheaded the formation of these societies, but in order to broaden the reach, you have to basically uh, formulate a worldview that isn't based on these kind of esoteric things. So it's not a cult. It's not like, you know, believe in these esoteric ideas or else. What happens is, is that these, these esoteric ideas uh, form the spearhead of the people who start the spark of these movements in the first place. So you even see it with Extinction Rebellion. I mean, I mean, 
uh, lady uh, Gail Bradwell, great lady. I mean, she's basically where she started was from this place of mystical experience through psychedelic drugs. She's quite open about it, so I'm not you know, exposing her. But obviously, you don't make the movement psychedelic or mystical. You don't do that. But you, you find many of the core members are into that. So what you find is basically the the the, the nucleus that begins these movements. We saw it with uh, in the last talk with these kind of like uh, English Civil War. The American uh, Revolution, the French Revolution, and the origins of the uh, sort of said Nazi Party, who almost changed the world and took over the world. Basically, it starts from a kind of esoteric nucleus. But in terms of mass movements, basically, you you basically um, uh, appeal to a broader section. But the important thing is, for the 21st century, I think you must have this kind of esoteric dimension. And in terms of the world, yes, yes, I mean, you, for broad appeal, you must kind of like, uh, I guess, guess, water it down and make uh, appeal to different segments in specific ways. So one of the things having a grand world view is basically, okay, most, most people don't want to absorb a grand world view, but you crystallize certain points from that world view, like uh, environmental protection, like uh, human rights, equal rights, kind of, you know what I'm saying? And you basically find champions within the, the kind of youth and with people who join your movement. Now, in, in, in terms of uh, the kind of like uh, the, the idea that there are secret societies and also sects in Islam, you know, societies in the West, uh, like Freemasonry or kind of like many kind of like existing, they basically know this truth. And basically, if you can tap into these groups, which are very powerful, then basically, I think there's already an existing network. And you, you can talk about the, the psychedelic scene. Now, the psychedelic scene is, is very uh, kind of like a kind of um, international. Now, now, I wouldn't base a, a kind of movement on psychedelics and, and psychedelic people, but in my youth, when I explored the psychedelic scene, what you find is there's, these are many of the, these are sons and daughters of judges and, do you know what I'm saying, military leaders and chiefs of police. You're hanging out with these uh, people, very well connected aristocrats and stuff. So I think these, there are these networks which are very sympathetic to esoteric ideas. I think there's a kind of undercurrent, there's a kind of hidden path to forming these ESA, these uh, social movements. When, when you actually dig behind these social movements in history, that, that is what these ideas appeal to. And at the end of the day, if you form a worldview, you must have a picture of the biggest, the highest, and that means God behind your movement. Well, if you don't have that biggest picture behind your movement at the core of it, okay, and I'm not saying you put this sense of the onion out there because it freaks people out, but I'm saying it must address the biggest question. We have a worldview, it's not good to say, oh, this is like, oh, this is our idea, this is our manifesto, this is our, you know, list of demands. You, you've got to be quite big. And it has to go to the highest level of ideas when people seek out what your message is. It really does have to talk in terms of, you know, world religion, in terms of what is world religion. So I think you need to present people with the big picture, okay, for the kind of like, a, the, the, to get the, the brightest and the best. But in terms of a mass movement, you present aspects of the, 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 the big picture in a way that they can digest and actually gravitate towards, like environmentalism, like equal rights, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, certainly does. Yeah, so, so historically, that's why the, the last talk is so important, because it kind of really kind of like went into the background of what goes on behind these revolutionary movements that is quite unknown. It's unknown because people don't dig, but it's unknown because the authorities suppress this information because they don't want people to start revolutionary movements. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let's answer your questions. So any... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said, but um, hopefully there'll be more, uh, more opportunities. Yeah. Really, this is a uh, voice in the wilderness stuff. This is really me in my spare room, voice in the wilderness, kind of like just giving a little talk. And I mean, you know, so, so I, I'm really kind of like not well known. I mean, <laughs> well, so, I mean, there's lots of revolutionaries who write to me already. I mean, you know, you know, Gail Bradford wrote to me years ago, I mean, before she started Extinction Rebellion. And basically what, what I'm doing now is just basically giving people ideas, you know what I'm saying? Giving people ideas to mull over. So I think that at this stage, well, with the last talk, that's what we talked about. We talked about Hegel saying, Hegel saying uh, he analyzed the big revolutions, English Civil War, American Revolution, French Revolution. He said basically there needed to be a secret revolution that occur, that has to occur before the main revolution happens. And he called it a spiritual revolution. He called it a revolution of the zeitgeist. He called it uh, basically a revolution in, in the realm of ideas. And I think that, yeah. that's the stage we're at. So basically we're going to foment the revolution in the zeitgeist and the, in the realm of ideas in worldview. That's going to instigate the revolution to come. Sounds like a great plan. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's the plan, man. <laughs> we got time, not much time. We, we haven't got hundreds of years, like, you know, 
The Renaissance took 100 years to unfold to the Enlightenment to the revolutions. We got decades, even less, but we got the internet. You know, we got ma modern mass communications. We, we, so I think we can compress it down. Okay. Speed it up. Yeah. Speed it up thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you, man. Any other questions? Any other questions? If not, then we, any other questions? Wow, that was a massive mega session, even longer than last time. My God. Well, uh, thank you all for attending. That's, um, that's amazing. We're going to basically, um, you know, we'll have, put us on YouTube and basically hopefully we'll get out there a bit more. Okay, so that's it. Keep in touch. There's loads more to come and basically keep in touch and come to future talks and presentations and, and you know, just keep in touch. Okay, so thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so great. Okay, any other questions? Just write in, and I'll you know do my best to answer. Okay, so, so I'm gonna stop recording now. Okay, stop recording. Okay, I stop recording. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, great. So I'll stop recording now.